You got to find another metric to put forward, then, right? If, you know, another proof of concept, essentially. Right. Yeah. So let's talk about metrics for a second, <laughs> uh, because I know a lot of people who watch my show uh -huh. worry about the same thing. Um, I have this ROJ measurement instead right. of ROI. Uh -huh. It's What's my return on joy. Good. I love that. So uh, if I'm good. happy, yeah, then that is like ninety percent of it. Okay, that's you huge. <laughs> Um, but there is such thing as a starving artist, right? Right. So you could be super talented and no one buys your art. Mm -hmm. You become famous after you die. Um, what good does it do you? Right. <laughs> um, you could argue, uh, well, you know, y you changed the lives of many people after you left this earth, but at the same time... You're not really around to make that argument. At right, that point, so. <laughs> right. Um, the other tragic part of it is if you love what you're doing and you're joyful about it, but you actually suck and you're terrible, mm -hmm. that's also a thing. Right. Uh, and so, and that's why I mentioned, you know, a lot of these other guys have the luxury mm -hmm. of having that, I don't call it a safety net or a foundation mm -hmm. of having built an empire on doing something else. And then they decide that they can do a show mm -hmm. because they can. Um, and so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's an internal struggle all the time. Like, am I on the right path? Am I doing the right thing? Yes, I'm happy. Uh -huh. Can I sustain this? Oh, wait, it's now been 10 years. Uh -huh. I guess I'm on the right path. It's right. yielding other Seems benefits and results. And if the, R, I don't know how you calculate the ROJ, but my sense would be, you know, a starving artist in that example, in the classical example, the starving artist doesn't care what anybody else thinks about his work. And I think there's a, you know, kind of a third model where you are making art or whatever it is you're doing for the sake of doing it because it inspires you, it brings you joy. But part of the joy you derive from it is in how it, how people engage with it, right? Hey, what's up? I'm Chris Guillebeau. I'm an author, traveler, entrepreneur. Got a new book called The Money Tree. I'm excited to be here on Behind the Brand with Brian I mean, Elliott. just sitting back, you know, <laughs> chopping it up, reminiscing about the good old days and all that, <laughs> you know, tracking my roots where I came from and where I'm going. Yeah, and that's okay, that's, which is not chasing a vanity metric. It's just kind of respecting that point of overlap. Yeah. You don't want to just be, like you want to like be in your cave and make something. This is how I see it. It's like I want to, you know, withdraw and make something. But then when I share it, like it would be nice if, so, if it <laughs> makes a difference to somebody out there. Yeah, and, and that's the other piece of it. Um, if I peel it back a little bit further, um, there is an ROI measurement, but it's a re return on impact. Yeah, also good. And Seth would use the term, you know, work that matters. Mm -hmm. So um, does it matter to me? Is it, is it making me a better person? That's also part of it. Um, right. And the answer is yes. I mean, this, mm -hmm. just being able to sit next to you and have a little bit of your fairy dust rub off on me is actually incredibly valuable. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I showed you off camera, we were watching right. that little piece of best In, advice. Incredible video, yes. I couldn't have got that life-changing advice mm -hmm. had I not been doing this. Right. So what's the return on that impact? I mean, it's everything. Mm -hmm. it changed my life, it really did. Yeah, and that's also, that was something that you talked about before, how it challenged you, like even in sharing that personal story, you felt like almost like you didn't want to share it, but therefore you knew you had to share it. 100% I right. wanted to throw up. Yeah, uh, so you should pay attention, to, you should pay attention to that. I think that's a good thing. I mean, me too, like when I, a lot of the stuff that I have done, I have that, that sense. And it's when I'm kind of in a long season of not having that sense, you know, I'm just like, I'm just trudging along, this is what I do. That's when I start to worry, you know? Because you're like, just, you're putting the points on the board, that's fine. That's also like a Seth model, like I respect that. But I think there's something to be said for what really scares you, you know? Mm -hmm. And what, what, what really scares you, that's probably gonna indicate something to you about your path forward, your ideal path. Yeah, that has definitely become a signal. I didn't figure that out until maybe three years into my startup experience, which was right around 2008, which I call the perfect storm because it was the Great Recession. It was a very difficult time, period. Mm -hmm. And then I decided, you know, to start a brand new venture mm -hmm. from zero. Um, but I did recognize a few years in that when I got the friction, when I felt like uncomfortable, it's this term that's become very popular, you know, getting comfortable with being right. uncomfortable. 
it was a signal that I'm on the right track. Mm -hmm. And then the next level to that came with rejection. Mm -hmm. uh, I recently just, you know, opined a little bit about this um, out in the open somewhere on Twitter or something, but I wrote about how rejection has so much irony and hidden gems built into it that mm -hmm. um, sometimes you feel, you're, you know, you, you feel like you're being rejected, but it's almost like you're being redirected. Mm -hmm. um, and that you have to really figure out, I mean, sure, it, it could be a signal that you need to go back to the drawing board, that your stuff is not as good as you think it is. Um, but it could also just be a no for now, wrong time mm -hmm. and place, so many variables. Um, that if you quit too soon, right. um, you may be missing out. There's this story right from this book that everyone reads in high school, like Think and Grow Rich, right? You remember that book? <laughs> yeah, I don't think I ever actually read it. I mean, I know of it, like yeah. in the culture, but I never read it. But. Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's sort of you know lore at this point. But there's right. a story about this uh, gold miner in mm -hmm. the gold rush. Oh, okay, I know where you're going with this. Go ahead. Yeah, and and you know he's mining and he's three feet you know, from gold, oh. and he doesn't know it, yeah. and he quits too soon. But he's only three feet away from the biggest gold mine yeah. in the history of gold, whatever. <laughs> but you know what my problem is with this story, Brian? I feel like so many people are living their lives like holding back from a change they need to make because they think, oh, if I, I've done it for so many years or whatever, and like maybe the better thing is actually somewhere else. And so when I think about that story, I'm like, how many years did that dude, you know, how many years did he invest before he quit? You know, what, if, if he spent 20 years or something, he could have been doing a lot of other stuff during that 20 years. Yeah. And also you don't, you don't know that the whole point is he doesn't know that he's three feet from the gold or whatever. Yeah. There's opportunity right. costs that you don't know about. Right. So yeah. I think it's, I think like, maybe you could have had a singing career. Right. It's not something, you know, I think all, all the advice you hear about, like, just go for it, just start, you know, a year from now, you'll have wished you'd started today. If you replace the word start with stop, I think it's just as valuable. Like, there's stuff you're doing right now that is keeping you from something greater, whether it's your calling or just some important work or some project. Uh, and if you stop some of those other things, you'll be able to move forward with that. I like that advice. I think that has a built-in assumption that we're self that we're self-aware enough mm -hmm. To, to understand our strengths and weaknesses, right? right. Because um, in order to do that, you have to have a lot of courage to be like, you know what? Mm -hmm. I am pretty awesome, <laughs> and I could quit mining, and I could go right. try and get, right. get a, you know, have a singing career. Sure, sure. Because I think I'm that good. Right. Right? Um, That's where the guy's getting his joy, though, you know? Right, <laughs> right. It goes back to factoring in some of those other things that are important to us. I think change in general is hard, right? I think change is like, you know, any kind of decision that takes us away from like what we're currently doing, whether it's good or bad. Like if we're on a tra trajectory that's that's working somewhat, I think that's actually more dangerous. When you're on a trajectory that's working somewhat, do you know what I mean? Yes. Like it's okay, it's all right. It's not like a miserable job. You hear from somebody who has a miserable job, like, well, you should quit. Like, what's wrong with you? You know? Yeah. But you hear from somebody who has a good enough job. I got benefits. You know, like I don't really love everything I'm doing, but you know, there's like a free yoga class on Thursday that I, you know, it's like, that's when it's hard, right? Yeah. Uh, do you watch The Office? Yeah. So one of my favorite scenes, and you know, they do all these little cutaways with the, you know, Jim and right, Pam. Right, right. It's this, it's this OTF, this little cutaway of Jim, mm -hmm. and he's talking about how he's been working at the paper company, and he's like, so I've been here 13 years. <laughs> 13 years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you kind of see in his face he's realized that moment yes. that so much time has gone by because he's been right. comfortable. Right. It's that complacency. Uh -huh. It's not been terrible. It's not been awesome. It's just been sort of right in the middle, lukewarm. Yeah. And do they just leave it like that? Like, I don't know if he says anymore. I don't remember that clip, but I think it would almost be smart to just leave it like that. They did. Like, they let, the, let, the, let the audience into like, oh. They cut right. away, uh -huh. and, and, and he, he just has that so light bulb moment. Yeah. yeah. Which is also foreshadowing for when he actually does start his startup. Right. Um, but I, I couldn't agree more that um, change is hard, uh, and arguably the most dangerous thing. Um, uh, I think it was Seth who told me, sometimes the riskiest thing you can do is play it safe. Yeah, right, for sure. And, and I've taken that to heart. On the other hand, um, I do appreciate change at this point because mm -hmm. when I get punched in the mouth, 
um, Mike Tyson. Uh, I'm a, I don't know. I'm a sponge for these quotes. Uh, yeah. Well, I don't know why, but yeah. Mike Tyson, right, is credited with saying yeah. everyone has a plan until they, they get punched in the mouth. Yeah. yeah. Which is so true. Um, and that's why I was kind of reflecting on this rejection idea because when you do get punched in the mouth, it forces you <laughs> to look at a new perspective. You're on the ground now, mm -hmm. either looking up or looking about trying to find your teeth or whatever. Yeah. Um, and you have to look for a plan B mm -hmm. uh, or get up and keep trying what you're doing. But um, change is good, Yeah. no matter how painful. And it's okay because sometimes, uh, or most of the time, pain's part of it. It's the human condition. Yeah. You can fight it, you know, and get punched in the mouth again, or you can be like, all right, what's this here to show me? You know, I've been trying to have that approach and perspective uh, for the past few years of my life. We were talking about the fact that you'd traveled to every country, mm -hmm. and um, you were like doing startups on about 100, you know, like mm -hmm. <laughs> dirt cheap, right. uh, you know. Um, Writing books, you know, hosting conferences, mm -hmm. changing the world, um, and doing it in a very unique way. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? In a very, um, un I don't know, undercover way. Okay. I, I don't see you as... Undercover, I like that. That's good. Understated, maybe mm -hmm. is a better word. Um, un undiscovered, unknown. Un, 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 unlistened to. I don't see like the the fanfare. Uh, I was watching that Disney movie Aladdin, the live version, oh. with my son, and um, he walks in with the elephants and mm -hmm. the people throwing the the flowers right. and coins. You're not that guy. Yeah, I'm still working on that. <laughs> the elephant, you know, entourage. Yeah, um, and yet the impact is not much different. Mm. You know, you're doing good work. Um, tell us what's going on. Oh, thank you. Uh, I mean, Brian, I feel very fortunate and privileged to be able to write books and record a podcast and do other creative projects just like you for some people that actually care about it. Like, honestly, every single day, um, I think I have a good life, you know, because of that. That's like, you know, the very first thing I think of. So I can talk about any specific project. I can talk about the new book that's coming out and all that. But ultimately, it is connected to that. It's like, you know, I can't believe that for all these years now, I've been able to make a living and not just make a living, but have a good life, you yeah. know, and. Can um, you tell me why you do it? How does it make you feel? Mm -hmm. Well, it's like a few different answers there. I was trying to think what's the best way to go down that path. You know, I'm, I'm so ultimately I'm self-employed because I wouldn't be good doing anything else. Like we were talking about risk. You know, for me, the the safest conservative choice is to is to work for myself. You know, it would be very risky for me to try to compete in the job market. What would I possibly do? Right? People often think differently about risk. Um, well, I remember you telling me that story years ago, if I remember correctly. You worked for like UPS or some sort of shipping company. Yeah, for you, like a minute. And you were terrible. Of course. And that was yeah. the moment that you realized you never want to work for someone else. Yeah, and I was 19, so fortunately I realized it then. You yeah. know, and you'd much rather work you know, 100 hours a week for yourself than That's an right. hour for some other That's jerk. That's the entrepreneurial quote, you know, yeah. an entrepreneur is someone who will work 24 hours a day yeah. for themselves rather than one hour for somebody else. That's like the root of that. But, I mean, what I'm trying to do in terms of, you know, the work, the books, the podcast, all that, ultimately, I, you know, I've had an unconventional life. Um, again, fortunate to have lived in West Africa for several years, traveled to every country, as you said. And so my goal is to help people live unconventional lives of their own, whatever that looks like for them. So it's not about, you know, trying to tell people, here's what you need to do, go do this or whatever. It's yeah. trying to help people understand that they can probably do more than they realize, that there probably are more paths and options open to them than they may have thought of. Yeah. And um, in particular, for anybody who feels kind of isolated or alone or Maybe their friends and family don't understand, like they have a dream, they have a creative idea, or they just have a sense, they have a felt sense. Sometimes it's not like I have this dream to go and do X. They have a felt sense of being unrecognized. And um, a, a lot of my work is, is about self-reliance for those people and showing those people, here are some alternatives. You know, Here are different so stories of um, people who have gone on a journey, either a physical journey or a metaphysical journey to 
follow a big dream and also make the world a better place at the same time. And these are just regular people, by the way. They're not yeah. you know, people that had this huge benefit or trust fund or whatever else. Um, they were able to make something of themselves and you, know, you can too. That's kind of the message. And that's very, that for me, that's motivating. To me, that actually is like, to be able to do that and to hear from people who have some story of some connection of like, I read your book and then I went and did this. Um, I was at this uh, documentary premiere the other day and uh, someone came up to me and said, you know, I read your book, The Art of Nonconformity, and I was in college and I quit right then and I moved to Hawaii for six months. And this, he's like, this was six years ago. And then I went to Cambodia and I did like, it's like it changed my whole life and stuff. And when I hear that, um, like I always want to make the disclaimer, you know, that it, he's the one who did the work, right? He's the one who actually like saw that. So it's not like I'm taking responsibility for it. But I, I find it motivating to have these little touch points and to be like, oh, Somehow in his life, he was, you know, going through this place of discontent and somehow stumbled upon this resource and it helped him in a small way make that change. I like that. Yeah, there's so much there that I think I want to underscore because it's subtle. Um, mirroring is so important mm -hmm. um, for lots of different reasons, in my opinion. You know, to be able to see someone, you can see yourself in them. Oh, I'm kind of like Chris. Mm -hmm. I'm quiet, I'm introverted, sure. or I love travel, or I, yeah. I don't like working for other people, <laughs> or I am sort of unconventional in just about everything that I do. I, I'd rather be a beekeeper right. than, you know, run a tech startup in Silicon Valley. You know, like, mm -hmm. um, there's all types of personalities out there, and to have someone that resonates with you to be a mirror at, at whatever age mm -hmm. because you, you could restart hit the restart button you know and you're 45 absolutely oh totally absolutely uh, and some of those are the, are the most powerful stories actually you know but i think that's i guess that's maybe the message that i want to touch on right now which mm -hmm. is um, you may not think that you have influence or you may not mm -hmm. feel capable mm -hmm. of doing what you're doing because you're not mm -hmm. chris or Tim or Gary or, you know, Tony <laughs> or, you, you know, you're not that guy or that girl, Mel, let's say Mel. Right. Um, but actually, it might be in you. I mean, everyone has influence. What is influence, you know? Right. Influence is not uh, the number of likes you have on your social profile. You know? Well, and it, it kind of goes back to, you know, the Gandhi quote, right? It's kind of like, be the change that you want to see in the world, mm -hmm. that idea. Um, the, the mirroring for someone else to be able to see that it's possible. You know, Neil Armstrong goes to the moon, every, comes right. back okay. Right. It's like, all right, maybe the space thing could work out. Right, exactly. And then you have someone like Elon come along uh -huh. who's dreaming bigger and doing, other, you yeah. know. It, and I think the challenge is some people, like most people, actually most of the world can't relate to Elon, even if we admire him. You know, we are like, I'm not like him, right, for all kinds of reasons, and not a criticism at all. It's just like, I can't imagine doing you know, what he's done. Well, I would have put that PayPal money right in the bank. <laughs> and then I would have just been like, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he put some of it in the bank. Um, but yes, um, that's why I think it's important to look at relatable people and then also to go back. And if, you, if there's somebody that you admire, like how did that person get started, right? Yeah. Like how many of the, have you done 500 of these shows now? Yeah, yeah. So like now everything is, was it as polished as it is now? I mean, in the beginning? Oh, yeah. I mean, like it was like a Hollywood production <laughs> right, exactly. from day one. Right. The point is, if you go back and watch the beginning, I bet you can see this evolution, you know, in your work. And that's true for everybody. Yeah. So it's, if you pick up on somebody like after they become famous, then it's very easy to be intimidated or to say, oh, I really like that person, but I could never do that because of whatever. But, you know, we're all starting with, with where we are. Yeah, and the reason I love what you're doing, like mm -hmm. writing books or the, your podcasts or the other things that you're doing is, um, you know, it's, it's all sort of about making it your own. Mm -hmm. Like, um, I watched uh, Ken Burns, who's a documentary filmmaker, is one of my heroes. Um, he did this thing on the Roosevelts, mm -hmm. which was fascinating. Uh, my wife thought it was boring. She fell asleep. But mm -hmm. like, what I when I watched that, I learned a little bit of something from uh, Theodore Roosevelt that I had not expected. Um, that, that then I was able to sort of implement and put into my, you know, daily routine, and it was super helpful. And if there's any th value that comes from doing this, mm -hmm. and we we're talking about this off camera too, it's mm -hmm. that I learn a little bit from each of mm -hmm. you. 
Yeah. Uh, and I feel like I become a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And as a result, what I'm trying to do is help make my audience mm -hmm. a little bit better if they can learn something. Because we all interpret this differently, right? Mm -hmm. Like the meaning to words are not in the words themselves, they're in people. And so as we hear either emotive language or triggering language or mm -hmm. something that jars us or inspires us, that's where the magic can start to happen. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the new book. Yeah, the new book is called The Money Tree. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I like it already. Oh, thanks. Uh, subtitle is Finding the Fortune in Your Own Backyard. So Let me guess. The best time to plant the money tree was 20 years ago. Right. The but next the best time. The best time is right now. Okay. Pretty good. I didn't actually put that in the book. I should go back. Um, it is, it's a story, actually. So I've never written fiction before, but it's a story. I'm trying to teach through it, of course, so it's still prescriptive. But it's, it's um, meant for people who wouldn't necessarily read a how-to book. Um, but who need to learn more about self-reliance, especially in, you know, regarding having an extra source of income, or especially if you're in debt, and um, especially thinking about the millennial generation of people graduating from college with a lot of debt, and then not just graduating with a lot of debt, but because of the you know, great inflation of higher education costs, but also um, entering a workforce in which there are fewer opportunities than there were before, so it's like this double whammy. I, I love this concept of, uh, appealing to the nonconformist, mm -hmm. the, the naysayers, with a thinly veiled how-to book um, <laughs> brought to you by fiction. Yeah. It's just fiction, kids, but really you're learning something. You just <laughs> don't know it. <laughs> well, well, I tried to what a fun real, concept. Right, right. Well, I try to write a real, uh, it's not, like I don't have like bullet points at the end of each chapter that's like, by the way, did you learn this? And here it is again, one more time. Yeah. And like, I really tried to actually like, what, what is this, the right story here? So I joke mind. about that a little bit. Um, no, I get it, it's good. Uh, my, my son is um, at that age where I'll say, you know, the sky is blue today, and he'll go, no, it's not. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> what is it? It's not blue. Uh -huh. Okay. And, and so uh, I have to find other more creative ways uh, for teaching okay. moments. I see. And sometimes it is through stories. Okay. Yeah. Um, anyway, that just hit me in a funny way, and yeah. so I, I, I'm jabbing you a little no, bit on that. No, it's good, it's yeah. good. Um, so it's, you know, it's about this guy, this young guy who, um, you know, finishes college, he's about 28, and he, he goes to work for an agency, he has a good job, you know, good enough job, it's not amazing, but it's good, and, you know, he's still, like, behind. I mean, he's still, like, his college, you know, debt is starting to become due, mm -hmm. he's getting kicked out of his apartment. It's he's, getting real. It's getting real, right? He's got this promising relationship, but he can't really devote much time and attention to it because he's really stressed, and he kind of figures, like, well, how can I get out of this problem? And, you know, the traditional answers for getting out of the problem is like, well, just work harder. It's like, well, he's already got a good job, you know, but it's not enough. You get a second job. And he's like, well, I'm not opposed to getting a second job, but most second jobs don't pay great wages. Sell plasma? Right. Perhaps, you know, but that you can only do that so often, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it's like you have this whole gig economy, which I think is, is a lie that's being, you know, fed to people out of desperation, you know? It's like people who really need, they really do need to have an asset. They really do need to have more than one source of income. And then you have this, this promise that is very well marketed and like hundreds of millions of dollars have gone into like this thing about how if you drive for Uber or Lyft, then you are an entrepreneur, yeah. which is completely not true. Yeah, let's stay on that for a second. Sure. So what is, what is mostly untrue about the gig economy? The concept that, you know, you have your own business or that you actually not, not even your own business, that you have much control in it. I think that's the, the promise is like it's a gig economy. You do, you know, you can set your own schedule and that part is true maybe. <laughs> that's the only part. Like every other part, every other part of the puzzle, your compensation is, is essentially controlled by these companies. Your competition is controlled. You could sit at home all day and not have any business. Right, right. <laughs> Set your own schedule. Yes, I mean, like there's all these studies coming out now that shows that, that most of these drivers are effectively making minimum wage. Yeah. You know, and if also, if they don't like you for whatever reason, they can kick you off the platform. So what kind of ownership is that? It's not any ownership at all. Yeah, we're being exploited um, yeah. and and taking advantage of, right. uh, you know, it's, it's sort of back to sure. um, big business bully mentality. Right, and it's a free market, so I understand, like, you know, those companies have been good for consumers in lots of ways, and maybe there's a balancing coming on that contractor side. But still, the point is that you're really not going to get ahead by doing that. If you are in a lot of debt yeah. um, and you need to get out of debt, you have to do something for yourself. You have yeah. to find a way to, to somehow work outside the system and so a you clear know, path to progress right yeah. and a lot of people and so i think the path through that is through entrepreneurship micro entrepreneurship in particular but a lot of people are intimidated by that or they think entrepreneurship is 
you know, the Silicon Valley model or the Shark Tank model because that's what they see. So you know? define micro entrepreneurship. As, as I think of it, like what I have done my whole life and career, I have always worked for myself. I have never had a lot of employees. I've never taken on debt. There are so many people all across middle America and elsewhere um, who are, you know, starting a little business based off of something that they are good at, something knowledge that they have. And, um, you know, sometimes they're able to make a whole living out of that. If they're not able to make a living, they're able to make some extra money, and that matters a lot. Okay. If you can start making some money, then that can lead to so much more, basically. So through the book, it's like the character is learning how to do that, you know, feeling more empowered as he does, you know, and eventually creating bigger changes in his life. And I think that, that everybody can do that. So that describes what my wife is doing to a T. She has a little furniture business. Oh, good. She's an artist. Oh, great. And she rediscovers old pieces of furniture, uh -huh. paints them, puts a, you know, it's all hand done mm -hmm. with TLC, yeah. and then she ends THC, up. not no TLC, right? It's all it's. Well, I suppose that could be a new market. Right, right. Undiscovered. Sorry, I didn't mean to derail you there. No, I mean we. we this could be, well, we're in California, so it's not coming. The up day up. that we discovered it, um, it'll be big in Colorado too. Right. But yeah, she completely flips it, turns it around, mm -hmm. and you know, she finds it on Craigslist, or sometimes it's given to her because yep. people just say, get it out of my house. Yeah. Um, she'll sell it for $1,200 or, yeah. you know, amazing. So that's right. micro. So anybody can do that. That's the thing. Yeah. This is how I got started 20 years ago. We were talking about the UPS job. I learned how to buy and sell things on eBay, uh, which was like a new website at the time. But ironically, basically what I did then can still be done now and anybody, anybody has access to it. So it's not like everybody should go and become a professional reseller. That's not what I'm suggesting, but if you're trying to like get out of a hole, this is an easy way to like gain entry to this world of working for yourself if you've never done it before. Okay, so, and I love this, so I have a quick question yeah. to, to interject, which is, here we are in 2020, um, you know, you started your thing was it 10 years ago, 15 years ago? It depends on how you think. My blog and stuff about 10 years ago, okay. I'm working for myself 20 years ago. So. I can hear the, the comments already. Mm. Oh, well, that was then, this is now. Well, actually, so, it's easier now, actually, I would well, say. <laughs> so that's my question, is is it like, is now mm -hmm. uh, more difficult or easier than the past, mm -hmm. or is it, you know, the same, you know, how yeah. does it compare? Well, I do, I do try to be careful about not saying this is easy because I don't want to mislead people. Yeah. You know, like something worth doing may not be easy, right? It may take work, it may require energy, you know? Right, so let's say that. But I would say that there are more opportunities now than there were then. There are more people familiar with e-commerce. You right. know, here's the story that I often tell. Like when I started working for myself, uh, you know, 20 years ago, back in the day, my parents didn't really understand what I did at all. And they knew I did something on the internet and they hoped it wasn't drugs or porn. But that's, that's all they could think of on the internet. So there's the only two inter industries on the internet. Yeah. Whereas now, okay, like, you know, any coffee shop that you walk into, you know, we're, we're recording this in a WeWork, right? There's places yeah. everywhere, like co-working spaces all over the place. Everybody's doing something. Everybody's got a hustle. Like my grandma, before she passed away, she was shopping online, which I never would have imagined, you know, 20 years ago. So yeah. I We probably all promised we'd never put our credit card number into that computer. Yeah, right. And, and then, you know, and we cross that line. Phone. Now it's just we, like, scan our phone to check yeah. out, you know, so. Well, I, I think yeah. about this all the time with regards to content, and I hate that C word because mm. I think content so... Yeah. Um, it's a terrible word that doesn't mean much, mm -hmm. but I struggle sometimes, even, you know, 10 years into this, there's so much noise. Mm -hmm. um, or what's happened in MySpace, which is all these competitors. Now, in the same breath, I'll say, I don't have any competitors. I'm only competing with myself. Uh -huh. It's, you know, it's like the runners, yeah. uh, PR, but who's getting who? I mean, I really do look at other people who have just gone sure. right past sure. my, you know, been way more successful than me. And mm -hmm. I think sometimes, what's the point? <laughs> like, I'm losing, I don't feel like I'm winning. Uh, I feel like maybe I'm sliding backwards. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, so how do you answer that? Like, there's never been more products, more sure. ideas, sure. more hustle, more entrepreneurship in the history of time. Uh -huh. And yet you're saying, Today's a great day to start. It is a great day to start. Well, I mean, this comparison thing, thing, this comparison thing is is dangerous, like we were yeah. talking about a little bit before. Like, and I struggle with it too. I mean, just to I can't say like I have the answer. I struggle with it as well. But I think the the question is, are you making an impact? Are you making an impact? And if we're talking about like a business, are you? Is it financially viable? Like, is it sustainable? You know, okay, that's great. Obviously, you can always do better. There's yeah. always going to be someone who has more, you know, money, followers, whatever the metric is. But there's also a lot of people with less, you know? 
So I think it's like you stay in your lane. I think that's the goal. That's, the, that's my goal. I try to do it, but I don't always succeed. Yeah, and I think your your pointing out micro entrepreneurship is really smart because you don't necessarily have to quit your day job to do that. Yeah, in fact, you shouldn't probably. Right. You know, <laughs> you, you maybe. And maybe that's not even your goal to, to replace it, but you could simply augment what you're doing. Yeah. Or it could turn out and blossom into something you didn't expect, and then all of a sudden you've got options. Yeah, I got a lot of people out there that, I, that have you know, their side hustle, their legit side hustle. It's actually an asset. You know, it's something that can make more money for them over time. They're not going to get kicked off of somebody else's platform. Um, but they choose to stay in their job because they like their job. So it's not so much, I hate my job, I want to do something else. It's in the world that we're living in, I need to have, I need to build security for myself. Yeah. Nobody's going to look out for me the way that I would. Nobody's going to care about my career, my well-being the way that I would. I'm so right. glad that you said that because I sometimes I feel like I'm the only one who thinks about that. I think it's vital for people to think, for think, think about it. No it's one. It's the truth, you know. Yeah. It's not a bad thing either. It's just this is a reality. Truth bomb if you haven't, you know, <laughs> had this before. No one is up late thinking about you right now. Right. Maybe your mom, but uh, probably not. Yeah, uh, she's got other stuff to think about too. She's got other things. But this can yeah. be freeing, I think. This actually, I can, maybe at first you're like, "Whoa," you know. But then you're like, "Actually, so, so that means I have to do it." Okay, you know, what does that look like? And so, how how do we? If this is not a how-to book, I want to ask you how-to questions. Okay. How do we get started? Like, what are some of the first steps mm -hmm. in? identifying the opportunities. Yeah, uh, skills inventory. Okay. Like, what are you good at? Not just what are you passionate about, what are you good at? Right. You know, what, what, what are you good at that other people recognize as valuable? You yeah. know, what's the overlap then between those skills that you have, whether you learn them in, in education, learn them through your job, or through something totally different, maybe through playing Warcraft at night or something, like whatever that, there could be a lot of different things. Yeah, and, uh, and I'll bet there are things that are not just tangible, like, you know, I'm good at doing hair, but it's yes. also like, uh, I'm a great listener. Yeah, and soft when, skills, right. Yeah, and when people tell me things, mm -hmm. I, I, I am a bit of an empath, and I can mm -hmm. sort of feel their feelings, and then I can make them feel better. It's yeah. that kind of stuff too, right? Absolutely, I'm good at organization, I'm good mm -hmm. at communication, I'm good at follow-up, very underappreciated and important skill. Yeah. Uh, yeah, all that kind of stuff. And then so from there, it's like, okay, I got all these skills, and then uh, another common problem ha people have is with an idea. Like everybody's got a business idea. Here's my business idea, but you know, there's nowhere in the world you can go to buy an idea. Like ideas are not for sale, right? Yeah. So you have to. So I try to get people thinking practically, and this is a lot in the book as well about like go from your idea to your product. What is the product? What is the service? What yeah. is like? How do you provide this service? What does it cost? How do people choose? To, like how do people commit? You know, and like thinking through that on the front end rather than the back end. Yeah. I hear from a lot of people that are like, got this idea, spend like five minutes or longer talking about the idea, and you're like, one thing you didn't mention, how, how is it going to make money? Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to that later. Never, right. never do that. Never, like, you can't, don't defer that. Right, or, yeah, or is there even a demand for it? Right, right. We're well, just um, kind of connected to that, yeah. I was sort of laughing inside because uh, I've had this secret idea for an invention, mm -hmm. which I will not reveal because it's so, it's gold. Right. It's probably going to be the ship that comes in for me. Okay. You know, the right. irony of all of this, all I right. will get 20 years into this, right. you know, all this time will have gone by and then finally I will execute on this okay. invention idea. We'll look back on this. And it'll be like my windfall, like, you know, uh, so interesting. Yeah. Make sure that there's demand for it. Make sure you uh, figure out the plan, how to Tangible make, idea, and then begin money. experimenting. Like the guy in the book, Jake, he starts selling his college textbooks. He realizes he has these college economics textbooks and you know, he kept them in his closet because one day he'd look at them and they, he never took them out of the closet. So he starts selling those on eBay and then realizes, or some auction site, I don't think I specify what it is, and then it's like, well, what if I could buy other texts? There's a whole market in this. Yeah. And he starts doing it and he makes like 20 to $30 an hour. And he's like, well, I'm doing, I'm making this much without even knowing anything about this. You know, if I learn more about it, if I specialize, where can I get more textbooks to sell? And then if I have this knowledge, what else could I sell? You know, and like one thing leads to another. So how far down the river should I look, you know, as I see this thing mm. evolving? Like, should I be looking three, six, 12 months? Should I be looking three, five, 10 years? Like, should I be thinking that much about it? Uh, I think it depends on what season you are in life. I yeah. think, and, and your experience, I think people are intimidated to think about like the three, five, 10 year plan. 
all that kind of stuff, especially if you're in a situation of desperation or you're trying to, to make a change or things aren't good. It's really hard to be like, where do I want to be 10 years from now and what's the step before that? Like, what's the, I, I would say, what's the step in front of you right now? What's the textbook that you can sell? Yeah. What is the thing that you can do to, if, if it's debt? What's the thing you can do to make $500 more next month? Do that and don't worry about the strategic plan. Let me give you a little more context to where, what I was thinking. I probably answered the wrong question, but go ahead. Not at all. Um, Let's take me, for example. Okay. I can be the case study. All right. So this is different going to be a different answer. Uh, so uh, this production company was my great idea, and it has been a great idea. And it's certainly, um, we talked about ROJ, return on joy, mm -hmm. um, return on the impact, the investment, and all that. Here I have invested all this time, energy, and equipment. I have sunk cost and capital and all that. Um, to a certain extent, I've, I've sw swam out into the middle of the ocean. Right, and so the shore is a certain uh -huh. uh, distance this way, okay. and the the next island okay. is a certain distance that way. Huh. Um, place to be. And so it's like, if I would have thought, as I was swimming out, mm -hmm. you know, about well, whether it's bandwidth or like um, causation, like okay, mm -hmm. if you do this, then right. this will mm -hmm. you'll need to do that. Um, it might have been beneficial for me to have a little bit more of a long-term plan. But I didn't. I jumped in the water and I started swimming. Okay. You know. I don't know if there's anything wrong with that because okay. maybe what you're saying is true. At the same time, I, th and I think there's also a possibility of if you had focused, if you had spent so much time thinking about this long-term plan, you never would have jumped in the water. That's not kind of my point. Like there's a lot we yeah. could say to get to that point, but that the point is you might not have actually moved forward if you kept waiting for to have every answer because a lot of the answers you don't actually have until you're in the water and you see what, what is this experience like, oh, this is going to lead to the next thing. You don't know always. You're right, and I would have probably asked the lifeguard and she would have said, oh, there's too many sharks out there. Somewhere it's else, you know, it's yeah. too dangerous. You yeah. shouldn't do it. And then I would never really have done it. Right. I mean, strategy is good, but like if you have to choose, you know, between like having this long-term strategy and vision or like running the risk of taking, taking, of not taking action, I think it's much better to just be out in the water. What other lessons for nonconformists um, uh, do you teach in this book? Lessons for nonconformists. Um, well, there's a number of like, you know, false starts in it. It's like he's trying some stuff and it doesn't work, which I think is important to highlight because, um, you know, your first idea may not work, but hopefully you can learn what didn't work about it. So yeah. let me ask that. So how, what are some signals to know when you should cut bait yep. um, or push through? Uh, I think there are two important signals, and one is like, is it working? Like practical nuts and bolts. Is it? Is it actually? Are you getting the response from the market that you need to have? Okay. Simple. And then you put it up for sale. You sold one. Right. Well, if you're selling something for ten thousand dollars, that's great. If it's for two dollars, that's not great. And if you sold one, and then also like, um, you know, are, is your heart still in it? Right. Is, are you still getting this return on joy from it? And you know, if you're not getting that return on joy and it's not working, that's the time to do something different. And here's a question that's come, been coming up to me. People ask me a lot about money. Like, isn't it, life isn't all about money? Why are you trying to help people, people only with money? And I'm like, well, ultimately, it is about self-reliance. Okay, and money is a part of that. But I think it's very privileged and kind of condescending to be like to tell people like, oh, money doesn't doesn't matter so much. You know, like if you're saying that, you're not poor, right? Like uh, to tell a poor person or somebody who's really struggling. Money is not the big, you know, happiness doesn't relate to money. Well, if they can't, you know, they can't make decisions without worrying about next paycheck or something, then that's, yeah. that, then you are very limited. Like, and, and money will help you have more options to do what is important to you, to provide security for your family. So that's these, why I'm trying to push on that. These food stamps don't buy diapers, I think yeah. is what Eminem said. Right, right, exactly. Or even yeah. if you're more, you know, higher up than that, like you're, you're still limited, debt is very limiting, I think. And so I think if we can try to remove that from people, then I think that's valuable. I will replace your limiting and uh, one up you and say that debt is crushing. There you go. Um, soul crushing and mm -hmm. life crushing. And then the opposite is when you get rid of the debt, how does that feel? That feels like a tremendous relief to people. Yeah. 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 I hear people like, I, have, I feel like I have a new life, you know, so that's, yeah, and, and when I hear you talk about self-reliance, I'm totally on that same page. But I think about control. Yeah, right, right. As, as someone, you know, from a very early age, um, whose yeah, control is definitely a trigger with me, mm -hmm. and I've struggled with feeling like I didn't have control. Mm -hmm. um, my mom was uh, divorced three times before I was 16, and I felt like, you know, I was just sort of 
shuffled off to the next mm -hmm. house. I felt completely out of control um, of my destiny. And I think as I look at it as an adult now, that's why I'm doing what I do now mm -hmm. is because for better or for worse, yeah. um, mm -hmm. no money or whatever money, I'm mm -hmm. in control yep. and I get to choose. It's one of your primary values. It's one of my primary Freedom, freedom, autonomy. You know, yeah. when you have that freedom and autonomy, then if you want to work a regular job, that's great, go do that. Yeah. It's, it's because you have to do it, that's what's the problem, I think. Yeah, or, you know, if you work for stupid people. Yeah, <laughs> right. also. That's also right. downside. Yes. So to wrap this up, you know, give some parting words of wisdom, some advice um, to those who might be struggling in this space. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you for, for watching. It's a privilege to be on Behind the Brand uh, with Brian. So for 10 years now, like with all of my work, whatever I've been trying to do, my message or my mission statement has been, you don't have to live your life the way others expect. And throughout your life, whether it's you know, childhood, adolescence, early adulthood, later, there are gonna be all kinds of people who have all sorts of expectations and assumptions. And what I hope to do throughout the scope of my life you know, is to show people that there is another way and so I don't have advice on telling you like, here's the way you should go or here's how you find that way. I just want people to know that there is another way and you don't have to live the way that people expect or want or presume or assume uh, or any of that. And you can probably do your best work actually uh, once you figure out what, what it is that you really want to do. I mean, we were just sitting back, you know, <laughs> chopping it up, reminiscing about the good old days and all that. <laughs> You know, tracking my roots, where I came from and where I'm going. But like I say, man, always said it. It's not about the destination. It's all about the journey. Ain't nothing changed but the weather. The dangling carrot that hang from the rear view uh -huh. Your dreams in the past ain't nowhere near you uh -huh. Backseat drivers got nothing but two cents Shotgun riders too biased, they all liars I should get an A for effort, I'm too tired